Hello, everyone. If you are just joining us, welcome to the Radical Exchange Annual Conference. Our next session will be the future of the corporation. I'd like to welcome Jennifer to the stage to begin our session. Thanks, Kelly. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us for this panel today, and thanks for being here at Radical Exchange remotely. Um, the future of the corporation, whether we realize this or not, is possibly one of the most important questions in tackling our growing inequality and saving our environment. There's lots of questions here, but I think it's safe to say that corporations are now completely pervasive throughout the world. We interact with, interact with them nearly through everything we do. Um, this almost positions them in some kind of immovable natural force in our ecosystem uh, that's necessary for, their, for us to live. But I think unlike water and air, they're not natural, which means they can be changed. They come in all forms and sizes. Um, you might think fondly of them as things that provide necessary goods and services, create jobs and lead an innovation. Or you might say that they're detrimental to human life, that they're destroying the planet, that they're creating greater inequality and doing nothing really of any great value to society. If we today especially look at any kind of starting point of a man-made creation as an early indicator, um, we can look at the corporation. Today is Juneteenth, a historical date in the US. It's the emancipation, when emancipation news reached Texas um, to the slaves. And the first corporations in the world, we can say, were the Dutch, English East and West India companies, which were responsible for the trade, the triangular trade um, slave trade, excuse me. So with this origin of violence and equality and justice for just the benefit of a few that we even feel today, corporations need to be reckoned with. And I'm glad to have joined me today um, several experts in this field. We have Colin Mayer. He's the Peter Moore's Professor of Management Studies at the Said, Said. Uh, business School at the University of Oxford. He's a fellow of the British Academy and the European Co Corporate Governance Institute, a, prof a professional fellow of Wadham College in Oxford and an honorary fellow of Oriel College in St. Anne's, also in Oxford. He's a member of the UK Competition Appeal Tribunal, the UK Government Natural Capital Committee and the Board of Trustees of the Oxford Playhouse. He was appointed commander of the Order of the British Empire in the 2017 New Year's Honours. He was chairman of Oxera Limited between 18, 1986 and 2010, and he's a director of the energy modeling company, Aurora Energy Research Limited. He leads the British Academy inquiry into the future of the corporation, and his most recent book, Prosperity, Between Better Business Makes the Greater Good, is published by Oxford University Press. Michelle Meager is a senior policy fellow at the University College of Center for Law um, in London. She's an economics and society, or economics and society, and co-founder of the Inclusive Competition Forum, a think tank focused on democratizing corporate power and the enforcement of competition law. Michelle is a UK and US qualified lawyer specializing in competition law and corporate governance. She sits on the Corporate Governance Committee of the Institute of Chartered Accountants in England and Wales. And her first book, Competition is Killing Us, How Big Business is Harming Our Society and Planet and What to Do About, will be published by Penguin Business in September. And Nathan Schneider, he's an assistant professor of media studies at the University of Colorado in Boulder, where he leads the Media Enterprise Design Lab. He's the author of Everything for Everyone, the Radical Tradition That is Shaping the Next Economy, published by Nation Books, and two previous books, God in Proof, the story of the search, um, the story of a search from the ancients to the internet, and thank you, and our keynotes from the Occupy Apocalypse, both published by University of California Press. And his articles have appeared in publications including Harper's, The Nation, The New Republic, The Chronicle of Higher Education, New York Times, New Yorker, among others. And he's also regular, he writes regularly columns for America and the Nath National Catholic Weekly. He lectures at universities, including Columbia, Fordham, Harvard, MIT, NYU, and the University of Bologna and Yale. And in 2015, he co-organized platform cooperativism and pioneering conference on 
Dem Democratic Online Platforms at the New School. And he co-edited the subse subsequent book, sorry, <laughs> Ours to Hack and to Own, The Rise of Platform Cooperativism, A New Vision for the Future of Work and a Fair Internet. I'm gonna kick this off. Um, you're probably never gonna hear corporations so much in one conversation. <laughs> Uh, but I'd like to set the stage with um, Michelle. You've been thinking about the history of corporations and how they relate to this present moment, particularly with Black Lives Matter. I'd love to hear um, what you're thinking about. Thank you so much for those um, kind introductions, Jen. You had a real mouthful there with, <laughs> with, all, of the, with all of the titles. Um, and uh, for setting the scene, really, that's exactly the kind of theme that I'm going to be um, continuing on with. And actually, you reminded me what CBE, the uh, commander of the British Empire, stands for. So maybe Colin can tell us a little bit about that in the context um, uh, later on. So often when we talk about um, the future of the corporation, we tend to think about corporate purpose, and I hope that Colin will be talking more about that. I know he's done a lot of work in that area. I'm going to be looking at the flip side. I'm going to be talking about corporate power. And when we think about the power of this construct that we call the corporation, sometimes we focus on things like the legal side, the limited liability or the privileges that come with being a corporation. One of the things that's interesting to me is the market position of some of, of some companies. Um, so if we think about the current context, we see a coming um, potentially huge global recession. And one of the things that really concerns me with that is the potential rise for um, rising corporate power when markets tend to concentrate during an economic downturn. At the same time, we've got um, unprecedented bailouts of corporations around the world. So I think that's raising really legitimate questions about the role of the corporation, this powerful vehicle um, for social change and what role that the corporation has in the economy and in the coming recovery. So I want to take us back to think about the first incarnations of the corporation. So you mentioned um, some of those already, Jen. I sometimes think that when things are first created in their most primal state, you can sometimes see their awesome potential more clearly. So if we think about something like the combustion engine, people were terrified at the idea that you would get into an automobile that was driven by this combustion engine that involved a controlled explosion in order for it to go forward. And we've kind of become acclimatized to, to the car. Um, and so we don't think about it anymore, but that awesome potential was really vivid at the time. And we think about the corporation, some of the early companies that you mentioned. So I'm gonna be talking about the East India Company, one of the world's first multinational companies. And we're going to behold the awesome power of that corporation. So the East India Company was founded or chartered by Queen Elizabeth I in 1600. And the exploits of the East India Company are truly staggering. It went on to claim um, territorial control over India for 250 years. The loot that was taken from the falling Mughal Empire and brought back to London, that, was the, that wealth was the basis for the entire British Empire. Little old England would really have been nothing without the appropriation of that wealth. The East India Company took it upon itself to tax the local Bengalis for the audacity of owning their own land. And it did so on pain of hanging, even during a famine that would go on to claim 5 million lives. And during that time, the shareholders of the East India Company elected to give themselves a dividend. When they ran out of uh, ways to take money out of Bengal, they set their sights elsewhere. And that's when the East India Company got it into their mind that they would persuade parliament to allow them to tax the tea that was being exported to the American colonies. Uh, the East India Company tea was what ended up in the Boston Harbor. The East India Company was also involved in the slave trade, not the transatlantic slave trade that we tend to hear more about, but the Indian Ocean slave trade, which involved millions of people being shuttled around the countries that border the Indian Ocean. And incidentally, when slavery was abolished, it was indentured laborers from India that were taken um, to the plantations in the Americas to replace the slaves. So if we think about that, um, the activities of this company, and these are truly horrendous abuses of power. 
And at the time, eventually the Brits kind of realized um, what they had let loose with, with the East India Company. And so they did what any country might do when they actually disapprove of the activities, but quite like some of the benefits that came with it. So they nationalized it. They, uh, that essentially gives us the British Raj, which ruled in India for 90 years until the uh, independence of India was obtained in 1947. So that's 90 years that the British ruled in India as opposed to the East India Company, which ruled for 250 years. That's what's most remarkable, I think, about the activities of the East India Company. They were perpetrated not by a country, but by a company. Now, the Victorians were very alive to um, uh, how unpalatable the activities of, uh, of what was going on in India were, the oppression of a country thousands of miles away. So they did, um, I mean, I suppose we might today call it a bit of marketing or a bit of um, whitewashing or CSR, because they decided to, instead of the unvarnished uh, uh, approach with the East India Company, which is, you know, this was all about profit, um, they dressed it up with a rhetoric of taming, you know, civilizing the uncivilized natives um, and bringing economic development to India. Now, if we fast forward to today, we're contemplating the future of the corporation in the context of lockdown, of recession, unemployment and civil unrest. And as Jen mentioned, the, the last time you can draw a direct link between the British Empire and the civil unrest that, that's going on around the world and particularly in America, um, not least from the colonial prejudices with which the, the Brits ruled um, their empire, but also the experiments in, in the corporation. Companies were chartered in England specifically to engage in the transatlantic slave trade um, from West Africa. And we can actually see potentially one of the most stark um, implementations of this principle, shareholder value, shareholder primacy, um, in, the, uh, in what happened after slavery was abolished. And it was a clear after everything that had gone on that compensation was due. But the compensation was not given to slaves and to their descendants. It was given instead to the slave owners. That was something like two, 20 million um, pounds at, in, at the time, which is hundreds of billions in today's money. And the UK government has actually only just finished paying out that compensation, I think about five years ago. So we see a legacy reverberating through history. And if we wanted to instead start again with the corporation, where would we begin to insert some new principles into how it's governed? Well, I think we would do worse than to look at the core tenets of the Black Lives Matter movement, which talk about collective benefit, collective production, community, co-creation, communality. We could bracket all of those under an idea of collective power. Now, that's anathema to us now that the corporation might be used for such purposes. But actually, ironically, the original model of the corporation, I hope that Colin might touch on some of this, was um, around public chartering. So a company in order to come into existence was chartered by the sovereign or later by an act of parliament or an act of Congress. So public benefit was actually right there at the beginning. Of course, at the time, the, the um, uh, will of the sovereign was to oppress another country, but we as a public have been through kind of several stages of enlightenment and the corporation doesn't seem to have quite kept pace with that. And I think one of the reasons is because we're still stuck with the idea of benefit to the shareholders and um, the shareholders being the prime stakeholders that are in control. So when we look at things like, um, you know, we're beginning to challenge, how do we tackle problems, entrenched problems like institutional racism? One of the key solutions that comes to the fore is representation. And I think that means representation amongst all of the structures of power in, the, in society and in the economy, and that includes the corporation. But I also think it's important that representation needs to not be tokenistic. So I'm really heartened to see that shareholders in recent weeks have um, put forward proposals at companies like AT&T, Walmart and FedEx to introduce um, employees onto the boards of those companies. But we also have to be kind of realistic about what one or two um, employees on a board can possibly achieve. They don't necessarily represent all employee interests and they certainly don't represent interests outside that group necessarily. And if we think back to the East India Company, it wouldn't have really helped to have wealthy Bengalis on the board of the East India Company. They were already complicit. They actually had quite a lot to gain from the fall of the Mughal Empire. 
and so, so too in um, in Africa, Black Africans did sell their own country people into slavery. So I, I think there's there's a really important point there around what what representation should look like. I think just to conclude that if we want to have a material change in the distribution of resources in the economy, then we really need to start thinking about co-opting powerful companies to public service. That means taking the awesome potential of the corporation and deploying it to our needs, our desires, the needs of our time. And I think that means economic democracy, not just political democracy that we're so proud of. In fact, I think that political democracy doesn't really mean very much unless we have economic democracy. And when I talk about economic democracy, I'm not just talking about free competition and a level playing field. I think we know by now that the endowments that people start off with are unequal, the power structures of society and the economy are unequal, and free markets do tend to turn towards concentrated markets. So I think we need to think carefully about that. I think we also need to talk about the money. Um, it's true that shareholder interests and stakeholder interests are not always opposed, but they're not also not always aligned. And I think we need to talk about some of those hard cases and the times when it is appropriate for shareholders to lose, uh, so to speak. And given this whole context uh, that, that I've been discussing, I think we need to talk about not just companies avoiding harm, but also um, redress and repair. We need to talk about how do we use the power of the the corporation to reset some of these um, structures of society and structures of power. I think a key point there is rebalancing the power, um, something that, that we've been hearing a lot about in the last few weeks. So I think I'll leave it there. I'm eager to hear what everybody else has to say. And, um, and thank you for, for having me here. Thanks so much, Michelle. I have a lot of um, follow-up questions or statements to, to get the conversation going after that. Colin, you focus on um, purpose, redefining purpose and providing a roadmap. Now, I wonder if you, based on some of what Michelle said, um, how much that, if you could, if you could walk us through what that roadmap is a bit and, you know, how, how to make sure that if we say, okay, we keep corporations and all they need to do is redefine what their purpose is, make a, this claim, what is, is there a structure that, um, that has an oversight to this and also the complicity to that, that we're all part of, like Michelle mentioned. Um, I hope that your, your, the work you're doing can address some of these. So I'm, I'm looking forward, could you please enlighten us? Oh, hold on one second, you're muted. There you go. Right. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, there was a uh, survey done by the Edelman Trust uh, barometer of people's reactions to how business has responded in the recent crisis. And they report that less than 40% of people think that business has done a good job of putting people before profits, looking after the well being of their employees sufficiently and protecting their suppliers through extending credit to them. Now, the importance of this stems from the fact that there has been a huge subsidy to business to bail it out of the current crisis in the form of loans, grants, and tax breaks. And that comes on the back of a lot of public support for the notion of the need to support business. But it comes on the basis of a presumption. And that is that there's going to be a mutual benefit to us as societies from that, in the form of business helping to rebuild economies out of the crisis, and in the process to support stakeholders as well as shareholders. And the significance of that is that 12 years ago, after the financial crisis, there was again a lot of public support initially for the bailing out of banks, which then quickly evaporated when people realized that banks were not responding by promoting their social licenses to operate sufficiently rapidly. Now, it is vital 
that business doesn't make the same mistake this time round because the consequence of so doing will be even more serious. Now, in thinking about how to do that, a key notion is that of the purpose of a business. The purpose of a business is the reason why it exists, why it's created, its raison d'etre. And to go back to Michel's history, I'll take you a little bit further back to Roman law 2000 years ago, which set up the first legal form of a corporation in what was known as the Societas Publicanorum, which was set up to perform very public functions, the form of collecting taxes, minting coins, and looking after public buildings. And for most of its history, to varying extents, corporation has combined in the way in which Michel was describing it, for example, through charters from kings and queens and parliament, uh, a public role with the notion of performing a commercial function. But over the last 60 years, the notion that there is only one purpose of business, namely to make money, has gained increasing force. Now, it's the origins of that change are sometimes ascribed to Milton Friedman's statement about the purpose of business, that there is only one social purpose of business to increase profits, so long as it stays within the rules of the game. Now, that notion has been incredibly influential in terms of the way in which we view the running of companies, policy towards companies, and business education. But there is a growing realization that that is not a correct notion of a purpose of a business. That the purpose of a business is something much more significant than simply making money for shareholders. That it's about solving problems, solving our problems of people, societies, and the natural world. And doing so in a way that is commercially viable and profitable. And that that is the challenge that business faces. And the way in which I define the notion of a purpose in this context is to produce profitable solutions to the problems of people and planet and not to profit from producing problems for people or planet. Now that notion of a purpose of a business is not vague or woolly, it's precise. It's not simply descriptive of what a business does a mission statement, nor is it just purely aspirational in terms of it being there to save the world. It's specific about what problems a company should solve, whose problems, how it should solve them, when it should solve them, and why that company is particularly well suited to solving those problems. And I want to illustrate this in relation to one particular company. And that is a Danish pharmaceutical company called Novo Nordisk, which produces insulin used in the treatment of type 2 diabetes. A number of years ago, it regarded its purpose as being to produce insulin. Now, that wasn't a particularly insightful or inspiring purpose. But it then realized actually its purpose was more than that, it was to treat people who had type two diabetes, which might involve taking insulin, but might not. So it worked with doctors, hospitals, and universities around the world to identify the best ways of treating type two diabetes. And then it realized, well, actually its purpose was more than that. It wasn't just about treating type two diabetes. It was about helping people to avoid getting type two diabetes in the first place. And its purpose now is basically to eradicate type 2 diabetes around the world. And in doing that, it started then working as well with governments, 
local authorities and health workers to identify the changes in lifestyle, which would help people avoid getting type two diabetes. Now, the importance of that description is it indicates how being precise about a purpose is very important and how a purpose can be really inspiring and motivational for all of us as employees, as societies, and as customers. And that notion of inspiring has gained particular significance recently when we see that there's estimates that suggest that perhaps 30% of the population might be suffering from some form of mental distress or depression as a consequence of what's going on at the moment. The notion of our work, our employment, giving us a sense of inspiration that we're really contributing to something that is of significance in our lives is critically important. But there was more to the Nova Nordis example because you might say, well, that was all very well, but didn't it eradicate Nova Nordis business model? And the answer was absolutely not, because on the back of building those relations with hospitals and doctors and governments and health workers, it built up relations, relations of trust by which it became a trusted provider. And therefore its business boomed on the back of the advice it was able to provide and the products it was able to provide. Now, the key question is, well, how can one ensure this is a reality and it's not just marketing? And it's important to recognize that this notion of purpose goes well beyond just statements. First of all, it needs to be embedded in the law. It needs to be reflected in the fact that the fiduciary responsibilities of directors of companies are not simply to their shareholders that one needs to put the corporate purpose at the heart of corporate law. It's important to do that, to allow companies to establish multiple forms of purpose that they can adopt, which go well beyond the notion of them simply being there to generate returns for their shareholders. But secondly, we need to have the leadership of organizations to determine those purposes and to ensure that they are embedded throughout the organization. Because it's critical that everyone in an organization feels an ownership of that purpose and that they feel connected to it, that they've been consulted about it, that it is something that everyone inside and related to the organization can relate to. Now, the formal ownership of a company is very important. And in that respect, Nova Nordisk is a rather interesting case because it's listed on the Danish stock market and the New York stock market and actively traded. But it has one dominant owner, a foundation. It's what is termed an industrial foundation, a company that is owned by a foundation. And that helps the company to be able to protect that purpose and ensure that there's a long-term commitment to it. And that comes on to the third element that's critically important. And that is the governance of companies. There's been a marked change in corporate governance in the UK with the Financial Reporting Council stating that the directors of a company must establish a company's purpose and ensure that it's aligned with its strategy, its values and culture. It should ensure it's got the resources it requires to deliver on those purposes and measure its performance by them. Now that sets out very clearly what's required to give effect to this. As I said, purpose is not just about marketing, it's about the strategy of a business, its values, its culture, its investments in the, its people, as well as in material assets, in its societies, and in the natural world. 
And above all, and this comes on to the fourth element, it's about measuring to demonstrate that the company is really delivering on it. At the moment, we measure performance simply in terms of profits. And furthermore, we misspecify those profits because many of them are not actually profits because they violate the second part of my notion of a purpose, that companies should not profit by producing problems for people or planet. The East India Company, to take Michel's example, caused immense problems and its profits were not real profits because at the very least, it was not making provisions for the costs associated with cleaning up the massive mess it created in India. But it's not just a matter of ensuring that profits are correctly defined. It's a matter of measuring the performance of a firm against its purpose. Its purpose in terms of solving those problems. Take the example of Nova Nordisk. Its objective is essentially to eradicate type two diabetes. How well is it doing against that? How well has it actually contributed towards bringing about that objective as a realization? One can measure a purpose beyond a profit and one should measure it. Now those four elements of law, leadership and ownership, governance and measurement of performance are critical factors in terms of the delivery of a corporate purpose. And a corporate purpose is a critical element in, in ensuring that business has the legitimacy that we require of it in the 21st century, and in particular, in response to the massive bailouts it's recently received. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. So I don't know if many of you know this, but I actually can say that I am a corporation. In 2013, I incorporated my identity to um, both challenge and protest what a corporation is and what it can be, and to try and use that legal container to protect my data. Um, what you brought up about that was maybe one good example of a pharmaceutical company. Another example could be that um, a, a corporation that produces pharmaceuticals uses the individuals um, that it researches on, with or that it uh, takes blood from as part of what goes into the value that they create. So in some sense, there's, it's not just the consumer, it's not just the, the uh, partners that you might um, produce a product with, it's also, we have now entered into a new phase um, where we are also part of the creation of a product and services, and we actually add that value. Absolutely. And actually one thing on the purpose side is in the US, I don't know how it is in the UK, corporations are considered legal people and they've gained greater and greater human rights um, over time. And this has actually influenced political, our political, um, landscape right now. And when I became a corporation, one of my things was to, to try and get in the mindset of what they think like. And defining my purpose was one of the most challenging and first things I had to do. And as a human, we don't actually think about that very often. What is my purpose in life? And if you think like a corporation should, it should be to serve others and like you say, provide solutions to problems. And we also don't think about ourselves that way very often. Now, Nathan, you're working um, in an area that tries to, tries to deal with a lot of these questions and how do we build corporations or how do we build communities that bring products, bring the services, bring ourselves the things that we need and that we share in. Um, and so a lot of what you've done touches on, you know, our communal value creation on the internet, up through platforms. And also um, one of the main issues that has arisen now is that corporations don't, first, 
the purpose isn't maybe defined or it's defined like Colin, you said, to make money. And that we see in the exit strategy. We're gonna build this corporation, we're gonna make this thing and then we're gonna sell it to Google or to Amazon, um, et cetera. And that's the purpose so that we have this, this process. Colin, you've been working on exit to, to community. So would you be able to tell us a bit where that fits into all of this and how that kind of can, can help us redefine where we're going with this? Absolutely, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jen. Um, uh, so I'm just gonna share a screen here and um, is that working? Yep. Okay, great. So um, what I'm just gonna offer here is I hope a, um, a kind of mythology uh, or a story that, that fits into and um, I hope contributes to the, to the broader story that, that, um, that th those preceding me have, have offered. And, um, uh, and it's particularly aimed at the, the logic and existing mythology of the startup. Right, which is a, a certain kind of company that is generally aimed around the kind of tech economy that is um, uh, focused on doing something ambitious. Um, it's high risk. Uh, it's new. It's different, um, and and it's creative. Uh, a lot of those things, uh, a lot of those characteristics are are good characteristics. Things that we'd really like to have, and and uh, at the same time, startups. Uh, as they've generally been produced so far, have have created a lot of a lot of troubling characteristics. Uh, uh, many of us are familiar with them in different ways, and 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 are concerned about them. Uh, and um, and I think this uh, part of the cause of some of these deep accountability challenges, as I understand them, ac accountability crises, um, is the kind of story that produces these kinds of companies and uh, the. Um, and the structures that we have formed to carry out that story. Um, and I, I, I emphasize the story because it's really important for us to uh, unlock our mind's ability to think about what's possible. And, and rather than always starting with structures and legal regimes and so forth, which I spend a lot of time doing, um, I think sometimes it's useful to step back and, and, and think about what is motivating these things. So in the conventional startup story, you know, it's no accident that every year um, lots of the people who are living and leading this story in the Silicon Valley area go out to Burning Man, this big festival in the middle of the desert, um, because so much of what this festival represents is um, is what a startup is supposed to be. They're temporary organizations. Uh, it's led mostly by men and in the imaginary desert, accountable to nothing. Um, and after a certain limited period of time, um, uh, it, uh, uh, it's meant to be burned down to the ground. And this is what happens in, in Burning Man. Um, uh, some other characteristics around uh, that Burning Man has is it's, um, it's a space that kind of presents itself as neutral and infinitely open, ignores external inequalities and so forth, um, and kind of imagines by being out in the middle of the desert, a kind of a uh, lack of accountability to the existing structures of the world. So the goal is to disrupt the existing structures, not to honor and build on them. Um, I'd argue that a lot of this is fueled by the current options that startups are driven toward, which is either an initial public offering or a corporate acquisition. Um, mm -hmm. you, you get bought up by a big bad competitor, you get turned into a child of Wall Street. Those are kind of the options for a successful startup. Um, I'm arguing that we need to recognize that there is a new kind of story being formed. Um, uh, and I'm working with a range of companies, both on in the kind of investment side and, uh, and on the startup side that are working to make this option more available. And we call that exit to community. And this is an option where simply Startups build communities, um, as many of them claim to do, um, and then when they mature, they transfer ownership and control uh, to that uh, to that community through a kind of exit option. So the, this remains a uh, the startup remains a, a nimble, creative, um, 
uh, temporary organization led by you know ambitious people looking to to make a big difference in the world. But the maturity phase changes rather than simply becoming a a child of of the um, of the investor logic. The the um, company becomes a community asset. And this is a shared story. So this is not a single model. This is not a single formula that we're creating. We're really trying to build a menu of options for how to achieve that. And so um, some starting points, just some kind of motivating um, events. Recently, for instance, meetup.com, a great website that helps build communities, um, was up for sale. It had been bought by WeWork and WeWork was collapsing. And and um, Meetup was part of this, the fire sale. Uh, the founder of Meetup would like nothing more, and I was working with him in this process, to turn the thing into a cooperative owned by its users, uh, by the communities that rely on it. We just, we, at this stage, we weren't able to get the, the financing together, but his desire, I think, is reflective of a lot of, of the desire of a lot of people in the existing startup world for something better. Um, and a little bit outside that kind of existing startup world and that, that kind of establishment uh, linked to Silicon Valley, Silicon Alley, um, and, and other tech hubs um, is a, an example like Tip Hub. This is a, an investment fund that focuses on investing in African diaspora startups that work in, um, in the Caribbean and the US and Nigeria um, and elsewhere. And they were drawn to this idea of exit to community um, you know, not so much in search of a better option than the um, than the the usual exit options, but in search of an exit option because the kind of capital markets for those conventional exit options in Silicon Valley aren't available to them. Yet they work in places with really strong communities, so they're wondering, hey, can we unlock these communities? So two different directions that folks are coming at this with. And then also at the same time in the last couple of years, it, the likes of, it's kind of amazing to me, but the likes of Airbnb and Uber have actually approached the Securities and Exchange Commission asking to start transferring ownership to their, um, to their most loyal users. Facebook establishing this um, oversight board is just kind of one step away from someday having users on that oversight board. Um, incorporating users into the governance of the platform. But while I'm you know, interested in what this kind of model can, um, can give to the frustrated people inside the big uh, Silicon Valley companies and the, and the like, um, I'm most interested in what exit to community can unlock in terms of you know, what, what uh, those of us in this, in this work call uh, Zebras. We're highly connected with a, an organization called Zebras Unite. Uh, which is a network of founders uh, uh, who don't fit the usual demographics and, and interests of the Silicon Valley uh, type of model, but uh, are looking to create powerful companies nonetheless. And this community ownership model aligns much more closely with the kinds of companies that uh, these zebras are trying to create. If we can unlock models for, these, for this kind of logic, we can unlock a lot of value that currently is getting um, getting held up. Um, really quickly, a few strategies. We have a, a legal uh, a law review paper um, that I'll, I'll share at the end that uh, offers some more details on some of the strategies that we've been developing. Uh, but the basic approaches would be something like either a buyout where you do a kind of leverage buyout akin to the employee stock ownership plan in the US. It could be something related to a token, you know, uh, uh, if, if securities laws comply, but, um, uh, but in general, something where the users more or less directly buy off the company. Another model would be federation, where you use spin-offs and divestiture to um, break up the company into pieces, um, getting the, you know, and in all these cases, I think we want to see founders and early investors see an appropriate return without, you know, uh, seeing excess. And then finally, we've seen a lot of interest from regulators in this kind of option um, who see this as a um, um, as something they might require that we need regulatory intervention and and that that uh, some form of co-determination or community ownership may become obligatory if firms um, uh, need to be repaired. So in in the um, you know, in a world in which exit to community is available, I, I, you know, imagine a few norms emerging. One 
the, the new mission of founders is to build ownership ready communities. This is something that this is their core standard, not simply to build um, communities for the purpose of extracting investor value. Investors carry the early risk, but the expectation is that communities steward maturity. That when, once a company is something that people rely on, that um, those people should be the stewards. Um, we also need policies that enable organized communities to access capital so they can do those leverage buyouts. Um, and then a basic expectation that if you're gonna, if you want users to be loyal, um, that in, in return, they should expect ownership and oversight. So if anybody here is interested in trying this kind of model, um, we'd love to work with you. We're organizing a, a, a series of webinars and, and other resources to support uh, founders and others who want to make exit to community uh, an option for themselves and, and their communities. So thank you. Thanks, Nathan. We only have a few minutes left, so I want to ask what might answer a lot of questions from the very top question um, in Slido, how do we deal with the ex exorbitantly wealthy or the exorbitant wealth of those in power currently, like Jeff Bezos, who has insurmountable economic gain over struggling communities? So, what's a critical question for reform for these kinds of businesses? What basically is how do we, what Nathan just said, we have, if all founders start that way, that's great, but we have these um, existing corporations to deal with. Yes, so I'll, 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 I'll just say a few things about this. Uh, it, it is absolutely critical. It's not just that it's an immense concentration of wealth uh, in the hands of a small number of people. It's an immense concentration of control. Uh, so uh, in the case of Google, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, not only accumulated uh, billions of dollars, they also had a dual class share structure, which allowed them to retain control uh, through uh, much of the life of the, of, of the company. Um, and that is an element that has to be addressed in a way that essentially uh, brings a closer alignment between what we regard as being legitimate purposes and uh, the way in which businesses should be conducting their activities. So a fundamental objective is to address problems of inequality, inequality of income and inequality of wealth and inequality of opportunity. Uh, and in that regard, if one thinks about that as, as an objective, it means that in the process of developing a company, those who are founding it, and it comes on to quite a lot of what Nathan was talking about in terms of exiting to community, that, that, that is one approach. The, the, the approach that I was just talking about in relation to Nova Nordis is a not dissimilar one, which is widely used in particular in Denmark, where families don't accumulate, or founders don't accumulate the sorts of Jeff Bezos, Larry Page, Sergey Brin uh, wealth, they pass it on to a foundation, um, perhaps because they haven't got children that they want to pass it on to, perhaps they don't think they're capable of running their business, or perhaps they don't like their children. But for whatever reason, they decide not to pass it on to their children. So they put it into a foundation. And that foundation then promotes the wider purpose of the company to society and to the natural world, and also channels the profits to philanthropic activities. Now that, that's, I think, an imaginative way of addressing precisely the problem that's being talked about here in, in relation to Jeff Bezos. Thank you, Colin. That's our time. I hope we can continue. I, I feel like we could talk about this for ages and I think we should actually. Um, I hope everybody will stay in Brella for those that are in that, in that area and we can continue this conversation and hopefully advance this to, to a better outcome. Thank you so much all for joining us and sharing these, these ideas with us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.